Hello and welcome back to the second in our series of Racing Rules webinars. My name is Neil McLeod, Racing Services Manager for the RYA. And in this episode, we're joined by one of the UK's top national umpires, Matt Goodburn. Matt will be taking a look at the rules which are relevant to the start and what limitations there are on the right-of-way boat. Before we get started, though, I hope you all enjoyed the previous episode with Chris Lindsay. And thank you for all the feedback you gave us on that. We've listened to what you had to say and made some adjustments for this episode. If you have any further feedback, then please do, please do let us know. Uh, before we get started, if you have any questions as we go uh, through this episode, then please pop them in the live chat on the right hand side of your screen, where Matt and I will be available to try and respond. If you're watching this later, then please put your questions in the comments box and we'll endeavour to get back to you as soon as we can. So, Matt, over to you. Okay, thanks, Neil, for that kind introduction. So, last week, uh, Chris covered in some depth the right of way rules, and this week, uh, we're going to focus on what limits the right of way boat uh, with a particular focus on the start. Now, in terms of an agenda, it looks like quite a few bullet points, uh, but don't worry, uh, we'll canter through them at quite a pace. So, we're going to start off with a brief recap of last week's session. Uh, we're then going to move on to the question of the hour. So does anything actually limit the right? Probably most relevant rules and the rules that we're going to spend uh, most of this webinar talking about, acquiring right of way and then changing course as the right of way boat. And then we're going to try and relate that uh, back to a couple of uh, scenarios on the start line. So messing around on the start line will cover some of those more uh, common scenarios that I'm sure you've all come across. Uh, and then we'll move on to some slightly more niche start line scenarios. And we'll finish um, with a couple of key points to remember that if you remember nothing else from this session, hopefully there'll be things that you can carry forward and bear in mind in future sessions. Uh, in, in terms of the scenarios that we're seeing, we're gonna start at quite an introductory level, and then we're gonna build up with steadily more and more complex scenarios. So in terms of a recap, what do we learn in the first webinar with Chris? Um, I'm sure this is a diagram you all recognize from the first webinar. Um, on the top left-hand side of the screen, you see those four right-of-way rules. Remember, there are only four, rule 10, 11, 12, and 13. Don't worry if you can't remember those numbers. We'll remind ourselves of those in a second. And then on the top right-hand side of the screen, you see that rule 14, avoiding contact. Now, Chris went into that in our first webinar, and while we won't cover it in a huge amount of depth, I think the key points that we need to remember is that obviously you do not need contact to show that a rule is broken. And of course, banging boats is an expensive game. And that as soon as there is contact, regardless of if you were the right of way boat, the decisions will very rapidly start to go against you. So please, please, please remember, sailing is a non-contact sport. So, just as a brief recap on uh, the rules that Chris covered, those are your four right-of-way rules on the screen at the moment. Uh, the first one, rule 10 on opposite tax, that's that port starboard that Chris was talking about. And you can see in that small uh, image of the two boats next to the word tax, you have the blue boat on a starboard tack and the yellow boat on a port tack. The yellow boat must keep clear of the blue boat, which is the starboard tack boat. The second rule, 11, on the same tack overlapped, or a lot of you will know that as the windward boat keeps clear. Again, we have a small diagram to the right of the word overlapped. Uh, there you have your blue boat, which is the leeward right boat, and the yellow boat, which is the windward boat, and that should keep clear of the leeward boat. Um, if you're at all confused as to what port tack, starboard tack, windward boat, leeward boat means, the best thing I think for you to do uh, is to pause this webinar now and go back and have a quick watch of Chris's webinar from week one, where he covers these terms in a lot of detail. Uh, rule 12 on the same tack, not overlapped. Again, a small diagram to the right of the phrase not overlapped. You have your yellow boat, which is clear astern, and that yellow boat should keep clear of the blue boat, uh, which is clear ahead. The final rule, Number 13, while tacking, uh, if you're tacking boat, you should keep clear of one that is not. And in this scenario, we have a yellow boat that is tacking uh, and a blue boat that is not. So the yellow boat should keep clear. Remember, of course, that diagram that Chris showed us, which is that 
while the boat's going from close hold up to head to wind, it's just luffing. But when it passes from head to wind, back down until it completes its tack on close hold, it's tacking. And that period between head to wind, back down to close hold on the other tack is when this rule applies. Now, this evening's topic, so does anything actually limit the right of way boat? And of course, the answer is yes. Now, if we revert back to that diagram that Chris showed us uh, last week, um, we have our right of way rules top left. And then as we move right on that diagram, we have those three rules that limit the right of way boat. Now, unlike those right of way rules, these three rules, 15, 16, and 17, only really focus on the keep clear boat. So in this webinar, we're gonna look at rules that limit the right of way boat's ability to in essence do as she pleases. Um, and to be honest, without this section of the rule book, the right of way boat could do as she pleases. Um, and therefore you'll notice that these rules, 15, 16, and 17, focus on what the right of way boat can and can't do. So they, in essence, add an element of protection for that keep clear boat. Now, these rules are found in section B, which is called general limitations. So we're still within part two of the rule book, um, but we're slightly further down. So last week, Chris covered section A, we're covering section B, general limitations. Now, there are two uh, other rules within section B. That's rule 14, avoiding contact, which we spoke about earlier on. And then rule 17, which is to do with a boat's proper course. Um, in general, we're gonna completely avoid rule 17 in this webinar. That's gonna be covered in depth in a later webinar. Um, if uh, you are with a rule book in front of you and you have the world sailing version, the page that you need for section B to keep these rules in front of you at all times is page 15. So let's have a look at rule 15, acquiring right of way. Here's the excerpt from the rule book. Um, and if we read that carefully now, we have when a boat acquires right of way, she shall initially give the other boat room to keep clear unless she acquires right of way because of the other boat's actions. Now, again, Chris covered this last week. Remember, any word that is italicized is defined at the beginning of the rule book. So for ease, I've provided the two relevant definitions here. Um, but if at any time you do need the definitions from your rule book, just flick back to the beginning and you'll find them there. So in terms of room, room is the space a boat needs in the existing conditions including space to comply with our obligations under the rules of part two. Part two is what all of these webinars are about. And rule 31, which is touching a mark while maneuvering promptly in a seaman-like way. So Matt, there's two kind of key phrases in that definition of room there that I wonder if you could maybe expand on. And uh, existing conditions and uh, maneuvering promptly in a seaman-like way. I wonder if you could maybe expand on what they mean for us. Yeah, of course. So um, existing conditions, in essence, um, if you think about when you're sailing along, um, if you're in a 40 footer in big seas, you're going to need more room and more space uh, to manoeuvre than, for example, a small optimist in uh, very slight seas. Um, so that's kind of how uh, the existing conditions comes in. In terms of seamanlike and manoeuvring promptly in a seamanlike way, well, in short, we don't expect an extraordinary or abnormal maneuver. So we don't expect you to have to crash tack, crash jive. That for us is not um, maneuvering promptly in a seamanlike way. Keep clear, that's the other definition. And that's a boat keeps clear of a right of way boat if A, if the right of way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action, and B, when the boats are overlapped, if the right of way boat can also change course in both directions without immediately making contact. So those are our two definitions which help us work through this rule. The other word that we do need to pick out, and it's not italicized, but it's key to how we apply this rule, and that's the word initially. So initially suggests that the rule only applies for a short amount of time. And in essence, it's there to give the keep clear boat time to react. 
Now, one thing to bear in mind with this rule, and in fact, with the rules that we cover on later in this session, is while they do limit the right of way boat, it's not um, an excuse for the keep clear boat to just do nothing. In all the scenarios that we cover in this session, if the keep clear boat does do nothing, then of course she risks losing the protection of these rules that limit the right of way boat. So while we're gonna talk about what limits the right of way boat, do bear in mind that if you are in a scenario where you're the keep clear boat, you must always be doing all you can to keep clear. So let's have a look at scenario one. Uh, and we're just looking at this acquiring right of way rule. In the top right hand side of your screen, you have a copy of the rule that we've just been through. And then bottom right, we have that definition of keep clear. So this scenario kind of builds up over time. So the numbers on the boats, if you can see them on their screen, kind of correlates to later time periods. If, so if you imagine, and you have to bear with me here, these boats are sailing up the screen as the scenario progresses. So the first part I'm gonna talk about are those two boats at the back. They're surrounded by the red and white dotted boxes. And um, I'll keep putting up red and white dotted boxes to show you the boats that I'm speaking about. So think about this scenario here. We've got that yellow boat and we've got the blue boat at the back. Return to what Chris was talking about in his first webinar. And you'll realize that you have a blue boat there that is clear astern of the yellow boat. The blue boat's clear astern, so it's the give way boat and it must keep clear. The yellow boat is, a, is the clear ahead boat uh, and it's therefore right of way. Now, of course, the question comes that Chris covered last week, how do we know um, if that blue boat is actually keeping clear? And we can refer ourselves to the first part of the keep clear definition, that if the right of way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. I think we can all agree in this first box, that yellow boat, the right of way boat, is able to sail her course with only no need to take avoiding action. So we're happy that the blue boat is keeping clear. Now, as we move up the screen, the blue boat now is gaining on the yellow boat, but it's still clear astern. How do we know it's clear, cl still clear astern? Uh, because the bow of that blue boat is behind that uh, dotted black line, which is coming off at the perpendicular furthest back point of the yellow boat. So the blue boat is still clear astern. Um, it's still the giveaway boat. It still needs to keep clear, which we're pretty happy that it's doing. Now, this is where rule 15 starts to apply. What we have here is the blue boat has gained on the yellow boat such that it's just established an overlap. Um, and it's therefore just acquired right of way because we've transitioned from in this scenario here, where the blue boat is clear astern, it's now overlapped and it's the leeward boat, the blue boat, so it's now right of way. Now, because it's just acquired that right of way, it's just established the overlap, rule 15 is on. And that's on your top right hand, court, uh, top right -hand side of your screen. And the rule says when a boat acquires right of way, she should initially give the boat room to keep clear. In this scenario, um, the blue boat has just acquired that right of way because it's just gained the overlap, but is it giving that yellow boat room to keep clear? Is that yellow boat able to spread itself further, far enough away from the blue boat such that the blue boat can change course in both directions without immediately making contact? The answer is no. So in this scenario, because to be honest, in the diagram, it almost looks like there is contact, that blue boat has acquired right of way, but it hasn't given the other boat, the yellow boat in this scenario, room to keep clear. Now, of course, we have the second part of the rule, which you can see in red on the right hand side of the screen, that when a boat acquires right of way, she shall initially give the other boat room to keep clear unless she acquires right of way because of the other boat's actions. Now, we've got three scenarios here. These are kind of the three most common examples we see from an umpire boat of where um, the previously right of way boat gives up its right of way. Uh, so in scenario one, which is the sort of bigger set of boats at the top of the screen, again, we have that scenario that we started with on the previous slide. We have a yellow boat, it's clear astern, it's give way, it must keep clear. We have a blue boat that's clear ahead, it's right of way, um, so that's fine. But then you'll see here, 
that the blue bow is actually borne away. And by bearing away, it's created the overlap, which allows the yellow boat to acquire right of way. So it's the actions of the blue boat in this scenario by bearing away that's enabled the yellow boat to acquire right of way. So in this scenario, rule 15 doesn't actually apply. The only thing that we should know as the yellow boat, and if you are this yellow boat in this sort of situation, is as soon as it's now obvious, because the, the blue boat's borne away and you can see in that final part of the diagram that the boats are very close together, the yellow boat needs to think about what is my only other thing it must do. And that, of course, is back to that principle of avoiding contact, which is why the yellow boat's borne away from. If we go down to the bottom scenario, we have two boats on starboard tack. And then uh, the blue boat has tacked uh, between the, the bottom part of the blue boat and the top part, it's tacked from a starboard tack to a port tack. Um, so the yellow boat again has acquired right of way because of the blue boat's actions. The blue boat has chosen to tack. It's gone from a right of way to a give way boat. Uh, and therefore uh, the yellow boat has acquired right of way because of the other boat's actions. So again, 15 doesn't apply. If we look at this final scenario, we have two boats again. It's kind of a reversal of the start of the first scenario. We have that yellow boat that's clear astern. It's give way. The blue boat uh, is clear ahead. It's the right of way boat. Um, but then what we have here, and we should note actually that they're both on starboard tack. That's not the relevant rule here. The relevant rule is uh, clear ahead, clear astern. But uh, here you'll notice that the uh, blue boat has chosen to jibe onto a port tag. So again, it's given up its right of way. The yellow boat is now starboard, or is still starboard. Um, it's starboard right of way. And therefore, uh, the yellow boat has acquired right of way because of the blue boat's actions. So here we go. The first question of today, make sure you read the information on the top right hand side of the screen and also look carefully at the diagram. We have yellow and blue are sailing on a port tack, blue tacks on starboard close to yellow, and when blue completes her tack onto starboard, both boats immediately have to luff and tack away to avoid contact. Yellow protests, and which boat has broken a rule? Give you a little bit of time. So you think about this and then we'll go through the answer. So in this scenario, the answer is neither. And I imagine a lot of you are looking at that scenario and going, hang on a second. At position three, we have a blue boat on starboard and a yellow boat on port. How's there not a rule broken there? Well, let's work through it um, level by level, if you like. So here's the first bit. We have two boats, both sailing on port tack. Now, at position two, uh, that blue boat is luffing. Remember, it's not actually tacking them because it's gone from a port tack and it's luffing up to head to wind. So if anything, perhaps it's just reached head to wind. Uh, but that's the luffing part of the tack we've seen between uh, blue one and blue two. And then here, obviously, the boat, the blue boat has completed its tack onto starboard um, very, very close to the yellow boat. So the blue boat has acquired right of way through her own actions and therefore must initially give the yellow boat room to keep clear. Now, the blue boat, as you can see, has obviously gone, oh, my word, I've tacked far too close to the yellow boat, so I need to tack back. Um, so that I don't break this rule 15 that we're talking about. I've acquired right of way. I've got to give that yellow boat initially room to keep clear. So the blue boat has decided to tack back. So in terms of rule 15, nothing's actually broken then. The yellow boat is still obliged to keep clear. So the yellow boat has um, opted to luff and also tack away as well. Now, if we think about the various scenarios, how could we get a penalty on blue? Well. If the blue boat had tacked so close to yellow, um, the yellow had to tack in an unseamanlike way, so it had to crash tack to avoid a collision, well then blue has broken rule 15. Um, and then the other thing to bear in mind is again, if the blue boat was tacking so close to the yellow boat that the yellow boat had to avoid before the blue boat had completed her tack, 
Then Blue's broken rule 13, which is one of the uh, rules that Chris spoke about in his first webinar, and that's wild tacking. Okay, so now we're on to changing course as the right of way boat. That's rule 16. So we've done with acquiring right of way. We're now kind of assuming in all our scenarios for this next part of the talk that the boat has already acquired right of way. That initial period uh, of giving room to keep clear is passed. And we're now focusing on changing course as the right of way boat. So again, here's the excerpt from the rule. Uh, we've got two parts to this rule. Um, 16.1, when a right of way boat changes course, she shall give the other boat room to keep clear. Again, the words are italicized um, and therefore they're defined at the start of the rule book. Those are those definitions we went through um, earlier on. And at any point you're going through these scenarios and you need those definitions again, obviously you can flick back to this part on YouTube or just flick to the beginning of your rule book to find those definitions. Um, so in essence, this means that when a right away boat changes course, she shall give the other boat the space that other boat needs in the existing conditions while maneuvering promptly in a seaman like way so that and we go to those keep clear definitions, the right of way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. And when the boats are overlapped, the right of way boat can also change course in both directions without immediately making contact. Again, with this rule, there's an expectation that the keep clear boat should be doing all she can to keep clear. Um, but the key thing we need to remember, whenever we're the right of way boat, and this is why it limits the right of way boat, whenever we change course, we need to give the other boat that room to keep clear. So we're, we're just going to worry about that first part of rule 16, 16.1. 16 and here is one of those standard scenarios. So again, we have uh, rule 16 uh, on the right hand side. We're worrying about 16.1, which is why that text is in dark black. Ignore 16.2, which is why it's in light gray. Now, here we go. That red and white box again, highlighting the boats that I'm talking about. We have a slightly different scenario this time. Uh, we have our blue boat, which is the leeward right of way boat. Uh, and then the yellow boat is windward. Uh, so it should, uh, it's the giveaway boat and it should therefore keep clear. Now, if we look at these two boats that are close together, um, you can see that yellow, in my opinion, at least from the diagram is keeping clear as she's far enough away from blue because blue can then change course in both directions without immediately making contact. So for me, that's fine. The yellow boat is keeping clear. We'll move through the scenario. We won't worry about two, but let's go to position three. Now, the blue boat's the right of way boat. It started to change course. So 16.1, that first part of the changing course rule applies. Uh, so it started to change course and therefore the blue boat must give the yellow boat room to keep clear. Now, if we look at this scenario, is that happening? I think so. The blue boat, yes, it's changed course, but you can see the gap uh, gaps in between the two boats is wide enough um, to suggest that yes, the blue boat has given uh, the yellow boat room to keep clear. That blue boat can change course in either direction um, without immediately making contact. We go to position four. Um, it's getting a little bit closer now. The blue boat is changing course, perhaps more aggressively, uh, and the yellow boat's unable to, well, it's still keeping clear, um, but the gap is getting closer. And then we get to this final scenario. Um, and it, to be honest, it looks like there's contact or, it, or perhaps there's not contact, but it's very, very close together. Um, the blue boat has continued to change course and the yellow boat can no longer keep clear. The blue boat by changing her course has not given the other boat, the yellow boat, that room to keep clear. So for me, there's a breach of rule 16.1 here. So again, that rule that limits the right of way boat, that blue boat's changed course too quickly and the yellow boat can't keep clear. Now, I imagine a couple of you are thinking about 16.2. Um, there's a reason we're not gonna cover it in this session. And that's because if you look in the first line of that rule, it says, in addition, when after the starting signal. Now, the theme of this talk is, is referring to the start line. Um, so therefore, we're not gonna refer to 16.2. But for those of you that want to know about this rule, next week, 
uh, at 8 p.m. Neil McLeod's talk on the windward leg will cover this part of the changing course rule. So we've covered the, uh, the rules in a little bit of depth. Now let's put them into some scenarios. Now, this is that diagram that we've, we're starting to see time and time again. Again, we're focusing on those rules that limit the right of way boat. Um, but now we're going to start to apply them in a start scenario. Now, I'm not a tactics or a strategy expert. There's, there's far more experienced and skilled people to talk to you about tactics and strategy. Um, but what I've tried to put on this page here is a couple of things that to me make a good start. It's not a definitive list, um, but I think for me, it picks up the sort of key things that I look for when I'm sailing. Now, for me, the rules are there to help you protect your start. And yes, in some disciplines, they're used much more aggressively uh, to ensure that the other boats are starting behind you. For example, those of you that are team racers and match racers probably nodding your heads. Um, but what I hope by the end of this session, by running through some of these scenarios, is that you will be confident enough in your knowledge and usage of the rules that, you're, um, that, that, that the rules won't affect you getting a good start. So a blatantly obvious question, I'm sure some of you think. Um, world sailing loves the definition. Um, so for those of you that do enjoy the definitions, here is the definition of a start. What is a start? Well, a start, a boat starts when having been entirely on the pre-start side of the starting line at or after her starting signal and having complied with rule 30.1, rule 30.1 is that I flag rule, which is on the bottom left hand side of the screen now. So having complied with rule 30.1, if it applies, any part of her hull, crew or equipment crosses the starting line in the direction of the first mark. Again, the definition for marks is italicized is on the bottom right hand side of the screen. There's the definition of a start. We're not going to dwell on it any longer. Um, the other thing I'd like you to bear in mind is for those of you who know your way around part two um, relatively well, you'll be aware of the preambles that Chris pointed out. Um, you'll notice there's, there's a preamble in section C, um, which basically says section C rules do not apply at a starting mark surrounded by navigable water or at its anchor line from the time boats were approaching them to start until they have passed them. To keep things simple this year, uh, this evening, and focus on the rules that we want to cover, um, please do remember that all of tonight's start lines and pre-start areas are in navigable water. So um, just bear that in mind if you're wondering about those section C rules. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind, here's the, the definition of rule 17 on the same tack, proper course. Um, I did say that we would cover it very lightly. We will, but, but this rule will be covered in detail in future sessions. So, I think the one thing I want you to take away from this rule for the following scenarios is that remember before the starting signal, a boat has no proper course. Now, if you have no idea what a proper course means, don't worry, we'll discuss what proper course means later on. Uh, but please do just remember for these scenarios that before the starting signal, a boat has no proper course. Now, I'm sure you guys are looking at this diagram and you're thinking, oh, I recognize a couple of these scenarios. For me, um, as a fleet racer, these are two of the most common start line scenarios. In the red dotted circle on the left hand side, we have that red boat that sat there. He's lying to, he's ready to accelerate away. And then we have that blue boat that storms in, tacks below him, and then takes that gap that that, blue, that red boat has been working so hard to guard uh, for most of the start sequence. And then on the right hand side, in the orange dotted circle, we have that green boat again sat there ready to accelerate away. And then we have the blue boat that comes storming in from a stern um, and then uh, positions himself or herself even to lured. So let's break up these scenarios. There were two scenarios, if you like, on that first slide. Let's just talk about uh, the middle scenario A, which is this light blue boat. Um, and it's basically tacking in. So what I want to talk through here is the transitions. So we have this light blue boat here. It's on port. The red boat at the top of your, uh, or nearer to the start line is on starboard. That's the right of way boat. The blue boat is the port boat. It's the uh, give way boat, so it should keep clear. Is it keeping clear? I think we're all pretty happy that it is. So the light blue boat sailing along. At position two, it then starts to luff. And then at some point in between position two and position three obviously tacks uh, and then becomes overlapped um, 
uh, overlap to leeward of the red boat um, and it establishes its right of way. It acquires right of way. So at the moment, it looks like the boats are spread relatively far apart. So the thing I want us to point out is that as soon as that boat uh, becomes the leeward boat in that scenario, it completes its tack, becomes the leeward boat, um, then we need to think about that rule 15 that we touched on earlier on, initially giving the other boat room to keep clear. It looks like in this scenario that the light blue boat has done that. So for me, there's no um, rule break at the moment. Um, and then the only thing to remember now is that fine, the red boat must now keep clear. It's the windward boat. Um, but the only thing to remember as well is that as soon as that light blue boat changes course, then we get back to 16.1, uh, that changing course rule. And of course, as soon as the light blue boat changes course, it must again give the other boat room to keep clear. Now, I think it's your turn to help me out on this one. Here's scenario B. Um, we'll talk through the transitions again, but have a go yourselves. And the question is, when is the first point at which the green boat has to respond to keep clear. Okay, so there's the answer. Uh, option C, the first point at which the green boat has to respond and keep clear is when the blue boat establishes an overlap on the green boat. There's nothing in the rules about having to anticipate what the blue boat does. So don't worry about that. It's as soon as that blue boat um, establishes the overlap and becomes that right of way boat. Now let's, let's break it down again. So the boat I'm talking about is that boat in the red and white uh, rectangle. That boat is obviously clear astern of the green boat. It's clear astern. It's the giveaway boat, therefore it must keep clear. As we uh, move through this scenario, you can see because the green boat's just sat on the line, ready to accelerate away, um, you have that blue boat moving in. It's still astern. It still is the giveaway boat. It must keep clear. Again, we're getting closer. The blue boat astern uh, is the giveaway boat. It must keep clear. But then, to be honest, in between positions three and four, that blue boat establishes the overlap to leeward of the right of way boat, uh, sorry, to, to leeward of the green boat. So it's at that point that the blue boat is acquired right of way when that overlap happens. Uh, and therefore that is the point at which the green boat must respond and keep clear. Similarly, as soon as that overlap is established, the blue boat is bound or limited by that rule 15 and it therefore must give the green boat that room to keep clear. So let's uh, talk about the pin end now. I'm sure this is a scenario that again, lots of you are uh, familiar with. You've got that blue boat um, flying towards the, uh, the pin end and then he's luffing to get round it. Um, and I'm sure a couple of you are sat there now going, hang on a second, that blue boat is making the other boats luff uh, quite high um, to ensure that the blue boat can get round the pin. So. In terms of the scenario, we've got the blue luffs inside the pin end of the start line with two boats to windward of her. Now, this is the one time I want to very briefly touch on rule 17, which is that on the same tack proper course. And the main thing I wanna look at is that definition of proper course. And that is that a course a boat would sail to finish as soon as possible in the absence of other boats referred to in the rule using the term and remember, of course, that a boat has no proper course before her starting signal. Now, one of the webinars in the future is going to go into a lot of detail about Rule 17 and proper course and when it applies, when it doesn't apply. But for this scenario, I just want us to remember a few things. So let's read the, uh, the description. Bear in mind that proper course and that Rule 17 we've just covered. Read the description top right hand side. So. Before her starting signal, blue establishes an overlap from clear astern to leeward of green and red. After the start, blue luffs above close hall to pass the leeward starting mark. Green immediately luffs to keep clear, and so does red. Now, we're trying to avoid talking about rule 17 as much as possible. So let me just give you some facts which will help us in this scenario. So 
Blues establish our overlap from clear astern within two of her hull lengths. And if you flick to rule 17, you'll see this sort of wording in the rule. So the blue boat may not sail above her proper course after the starting signal. But in this scenario, because of course, blue wants to participate in the race and sail the course, here, blue's proper course is to luff to pass the mark. Now, that all said, uh, the blue boat must still give the woman boats room to keep clear when she luffs. So there's our key fact. The blue must give the woman boat room to keep clear whenever she changes course. So let's work through this scenario from the back. We know that the blue boat can luff above its proper course, so above close hauled, if you like. Uh, in this scenario to go round the pin end. So let's not worry about that and let's think about the two key rules that we've been talking about all evening. Now, at the start of this scenario, uh, we have the blues, the most lure boat, then the green, then the red boat. Um, we're going to assume that rule 15, that acquiring right of way, doesn't apply anymore because um, that blue boat has been right of way for a period of time. So we're just worrying about that changing course rule 16.1. So you can see here that blue's holding her course, the green and the red boats are keeping clear. And then in two, there's a slight change up, there's a slight luff from the blue boat, but the green and the red boats are still able to keep clear. But then at this last bit here, there's a more aggressive change from blue. Um, but again, the green and the red boats are able to keep clear. So in this scenario, again, there's no breach of 16.1, but what I want us to really understand, and I'm going to be constantly drilling it home, and I have been throughout this presentation, is that the blue boat is the right-of-way boat. Anytime the blue boat changes course, it must give the other boats that room to keep clear. Uh, so if we think about other scenarios, say, for example, there was contact, or not even contact, perhaps there was the green and the blue boat got too close together. So the blue boat changed her course too quickly, so the green boat couldn't keep clear. Well, then the blue boat will have broken rule 16.1, that change in course rule. But if the blue boat changed her course very slowly, gave that green boat the opportunity to, uh, or the room to keep clear, and the green boat just didn't respond promptly uh, or in a similar -like fashion, then in fact, the, the green boat's broken that uh, one of the first right of way rules that Chris talked about on that rule 11. So again, key point from this session, any time the right-of-way boat changes course, uh, they must give the other boats room to keep clear. OK, so we've moved from the pin end of the start line down to the other end, to the committee boat end. Um, and these boats are approaching the line to start. Now, you'll see a blue box um, that has that preamble to section C. Um, don't worry about that. The only thing I would say is that when the boats are approaching the line to start, all these rules about mark rooms and obstructions um, do not apply. Um, but if you're not sure what they are, don't worry, they'll be covered in next week's session by Neil in quite some detail. The other thing that's worth uh, pointing out is that phrase navigable water in that preamble. Um, and I guess this sort of thing really applies to lots of you that, for example, river sailors, um, or your start line is very close to a sandbank, et cetera. Um, in that case, these obstruction rules um, may or will likely apply. So navigable water, basically, um, in the situation you see on the left-hand side of the screen, there's nothing um, around uh, that committee boat, around the start line, that's going to cause any problems to the boats trying to participate in the start. It looks like there's no room for the blue boat to pass between the committee boat and the yellow boat, fine. Um, but of course, uh, let's talk through it. So we've got that standard scenario. We've got the yellow boat, lured right, right of way boat. Uh, and then we've got the blue boat, it's the windward boat, it's the giveaway boat, it should keep clear. Looks like that's all fine there. How do we know the blue boat's keeping clear enough? Well, there's room for the yellow boat to change her course in both directions without immediately making contact. So we're happy. Now, you've got the yellow boat changing up here. It's changing its course. The blue boat's having to luff, which you can see with those flappy sails, to keep clear. But again, that course change is absolutely fine. The blue boat is reacting promptly to keep clear. And then at the last minute, this classic scenario, there's no room for that blue boat to fit in there. So the yellow boat has done its job really well. Um, 
it's basically stopped changing its course. The blue has decided there's nowhere for it to go. So it's had to luff and tack out. Again, remember the key principles that we're trying to go through. Um, so every time the yellow boat, the right away boat changes its course, it must give the other boat room to keep clear. Now, saw a couple of you sat there and going, how on earth do we know if we're approaching a line to start? Well, there's an excerpt here, um, which doesn't say anything uh, particularly exciting, but it, it will help you perhaps get into the head of an umpire. This is how we think about it when we're umpiring on the water. So how do the umpires decide if a boat is approaching a starting mark to start? Well, in each of the diagrams you see there, you've got 1A, 1B, 1C. The boat may be approaching the starting mark to start. And all I'd like to kind of add in here is that the umpires will use the speed and course of the boat and the prevailing conditions and the time remaining before the starting signal to decide if they are approaching a starting mark to start. So here we go. Here's another scenario, but we've got the other one now. So it looks, to be honest, like the blue boat's managed to squeeze in. But in this scenario, we've got that the yellow boat has left the luff a little bit too late. Um, this is a common scenario. I think we all find ourselves in with that blue boat. We're stuck there. Uh, I'm trying to keep clear, but the bow of my boat is so close to that committee boat that there's not really anything I can do. Again, we're just talking about the final part of this scenario in that red and white dotted box. And quite a few people ask this question. If I'm that blue boat, I'm trying to keep clear, right? Every time that yellow boat changes its course, it's got to give me room to keep clear. But, but where on earth am I going to, going to keep clear to? Surely, if anything, if I laugh to keep clear, the bow of my boat is just going to hit uh, the sort of port, uh, port quarter of that committee boat. So there's a couple of cases on this um, which help. But in essence, the answer, can you be luffed into the committee boat? The answer is no. If you look, uh, if you love your cases, there's case 114 uh, and then there's case 146. These are those uh, cases that Chris was talking about that are produced by World Sailing to add further clarification to a rule. Um, and the answer is no. Um, can you be laughed in the committee boat? Touching such a mark, and this is the wording from case 114, touching such a mark risks damaging either the boat racing or the committee boat, and taking such a risk is not seamanlike. Now, how does this uh, apply to rule 16.1? Well, that blue boat, remember every time the yellow boat changes course, because it's lured right there, it's the right of way boat, every time it changes course, it's got to give the blue boat room to keep clear. And that blue boat is entitled to room uh, a room under 16.1, so it's entitled to the space that she needs to manoeuvre in a seaman-like way to keep clear. But World Sailing have now said that hitting the committee boat is not seaman-like. So in this scenario, um, if that yellow boat were to luff the blue boat into the committee boat because that blue boat's got her nose in, uh, then that yellow boat would be breaking the rule. Again, there's your definition of room uh, for those of you that were wondering about it, but I think we've covered that. So I think this is the final question of tonight. We're nearly there, so bear with me. Um, this is a little bit of a trick question, uh, partly because a lot of the rules that relate to getting this answer right are gonna be actually covered by Neil in next week's session. But let's uh, read the description on the top right-hand side. So about 90 seconds before the start, blue and white are approaching the committee boat overlapped on starboard tack. Now white does not allow blue room to pass between her and the committee boat. Blue is forced to laugh and tack away, whilst white bears away sharply. There's a valid process, protest. Now, what should the call be? So have a, have a little bit of time to think about that, and then we'll go through the answer. OK, right, let's have a look at the answer. So. The answer is penalise white, and Neil's going to go into detail around the rules as to why this is the case. But I want us to note something, and it's really highlighting how the preambles apply. You'll see in red now, it says about 90 seconds before the start. So if we go to our Section C preamble, it says Section C rules do not apply, a starting mark, blah, 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 from the time the boats are approaching them to start until they have passed them. Now, because those boats in that scenario, if we drop back, are clearly not approaching the start. They're so close to the committee boat with 90 seconds before the start. 
um, these Section C rules do actually apply. And that's all I want to cover on that. Neil will go into detail with uh, room to pass and obstruction, room to tackle and obstruction, and obviously 18 mark room will be covered in later scenarios. So we're nearly there. Pretty much the last area we're going to talk about tonight, some other slightly more niche scenarios. We're going to go to section D, which is other rules. So we're getting right to the back end of part two now. Um, and we have rule 22, which is starting errors, taking penalties, and backing a sale. Now, obviously, because we're talking about the start, we're only really concerned about um, 22.1 and 22.3, which are those rules in red. Um, and we've got 22.1, which is a boat sailing towards the pre-start side of the starting line or one of its extensions after her starting signal to start or to comply with rule 30.1, shall keep clear of a boat not doing so until she is completely on the pre-start side. We'll look at a scenario in a second. And then 22.3, a boat moving astern or sideways to windward through the water by backing a sail shall keep clear of one that is not. Now, as I said earlier on, in sailing, we love a preamble. So again, here's the preamble to section D, uh, which is other rules, this section is called. It's just a miscellaneous collection, I guess, of the other rules that they've not covered in the previous three sections. Um, and that's when rule 22 or 23 applies, section A rules do not. We're not talking about 23 in this presentation, we're just talking about 22. What are those section A rules? Well, of course, they're the section A rules that Chris covered in webinar one, the right of way rules, rule 10, port starboard, rule 11, uh, windward lured, rule 12, the astern boat keeps clear, and then rule 13 while tacking. So, very simple scenario here, and we're in those last two bits, the end of this presentation, backing a sail. Well, in essence, that boat that's moving astern through the water by backing her sail shall keep clear of one that is not. So in this scenario, the blue boat has to keep clear of the yellow boat. Um, for those of you that are match racer, you probably sat there going, hang on a second, this, this scenario is familiar to me. Um, and my answer to you is that yes, if you are a match racer, the reason it's not familiar is because in your appendix, which are towards the back of those rule books, um, rule 22.3, the bit about moving a stern sideways to windward is deleted. Um, so if you're a match racer, ignore this slide and the slide before. The last thing we're going to talk about is 22.1, uh, which is that a boat sailing towards the pre-start side of the starting line or one of its extensions after her starting signal to start um, shall keep clear of a boat not doing so until she is completely on the pre-start side. Now, I'm sure a couple of you are thinking, hang on a second, that looks like a port starboard, certainly towards the top of the diagram. Remember that preamble to section D that the uh, rules of section A do not apply when uh, 22 and 23 apply. So in this case, that blue boat, certainly from position five, if not well, certainly from position six, if not position five, is returning to start, so she must keep clear of a boat not doing so. So we're there. We've run through the scenarios. I know it's been a bit of a long trip, um, and I hopefully I've not lost any of you. Remember, of course, that because this webinar is on YouTube, um, if you need to go through any of the scenarios, just pause, rewind, take it at your own pace. In terms of the key takeaway points that I want you to uh, take away from this session and then bring forward into next week's webinar is that there are four right-of-way rules and three rules that limit the right-of-way boat. That when a boat acquires right-of-way, she shall initially give the other boat room to keep clear. When the right-of-way boat changes course, she shall give the other boat room to keep clear. Um, and then of course, I know I've been banging on about the definitions and highlighting preambles all over the shop in this webinar. Um, do try and remember the preambles um, and certainly learn the definitions because that will really help you in your racing. So let's see what we've covered. It's been a long session. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, the right of way rules Chris covered. So they're all done and dusted that diagram. We get to rules that limit the right of way boat. We've done rule 15, that acquiring right of way, pretty heavily tonight. Um, 16 and 17, we've put orange ticks on. Um, the reason for that is that we've not done 16.2, that thing that um, happens after the starting signal. Neil will cover that next week. 
Um, and 17, we've only really discussed it in a very brief uh, context in the pre-start scenario. So that's, again, going to be covered in a lot more detail in future sessions. On the right-hand side, 22, OCS, et cetera, is also green ticked. We've done that rule. We can tick it off and we can move on. So other than that, that's me done. I hope it's been a useful session. Um, and I'll hand back to Neil now, who I'm sure is going to be advertising uh, the session that he's doing next week. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, everyone, for watching the second of our Racing Rules series. We hope that you found the session informative, and if you get any feedback, then please do put it in the comments box or drop us an email at racingrules at rye.org.uk. So in our next episode, Chris Lindsay will be returning to host, and I'll be doing the presenting. I'm going to take you through the windward leg and the rules that come into play when we encounter obstructions. So I hope to see you there. And thanks and goodbye.